Yeah, last time I did a movie review, I had the big sword. Um, instead, I'm just going to come in here with a big disclaimer. There's going to be a lot of spoilers that I'm going to have to talk about in order to discuss certain elements of this review. So let me get this out of the way right now. It's a pretty impressive movie, but if you're a fan of comic books or other specific elements tied into certain characters who have been very much highlighted in the marketing to this movie, it might piss you off a little. And the more I think about this movie, the less I like it. So let's start with that. Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we've got another unscripted movie review, this time of the newest project from Marvel Studios, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. This is going to sound a little bit complex, but I want to start with this premise. I'm not always the biggest fan of multiverse storytelling. Now, this has existed in comics for decades now, where oftentimes they use the whole concept of a multiverse to have, hey, within this specific alternate universe, this is how certain heroes might behave, or this these heroes are now villains and the villains are now heroes. Both DC and Marvel have done this, and they've done it for decades, and oftentimes they use it to kind of bend around issues with their content. Continuity. Okay, it's kind of novel. Once you get a hang of how the writing and flow of it ultimately is, you I, it's tolerable. For me, it tends to get a little bit annoying because the whole idea that there are so many other different universes that you can go to does weird things with the stakes of the whole film and the story you're trying to tell. Because if it's all happening within this universe and there's an entire other universe where it didn't happen, if you have the ability to transverse and travel between universes, it kind of removes some of the sense of stakes that might come if a character dies or there's a major change or point of trauma. Now, Marvel's been dabbling with multiverse storytelling for a couple of years now, and more often than not, some actually some pretty good effect. The whole thing was really kicked off with Into the Spider-Verse, which is a great movie. Now, they've really circled a lot of this around Spider-Man, especially most recently with No Way Home, which I'd probably say is some of the most effective balancing of that sort of multiverse storytelling intertwined with a lot of really defined character drama and the amount of fan service they were allowed to cram in because that's the other thing multiverse storytelling has a lot of potential to say interesting philosophical things about how characters exist in one universe versus another, and how specific continuities can intersect. No Way Home did a lot of great things with how specific Spider-Man villains were able to intersect and interact with each other, and the whole idea of potentially sending them back to their own universe to then die. That's a very loaded premise to actually introduce some real moral quandaries. And honestly, given how involved Doctor Strange was in a lot of No Way Home, it actually worked really well in driving the moral thesis and ideas behind that movie while still actually meaning to give it some real consequences. Yeah, No Way Home is great. Um, I didn't review that movie formally and even in an unscripted fashion, but yeah, great movie. Highly recommended. And thus, that's one of the reasons I really was excited to speak about this one because, again, if anything, No Way Home kind of sold me on Doctor Strange because I thought the original Doctor Strange Strange movie was fine, but I'm never a huge fan of him in the comics, and I thought his involvement in Infinity War and Endgame was fine for what it was, but it wasn't enough to wow me. Really introducing him more into No Way Home was what kind of sold me on that character. The other thing, though, is that there is another central character from Marvel continuity that's also going to be flowing into Multiverse of Madness. You've probably already seen her shown in the marketing, and that's Wanda Maximoff, aka the Scarlet Witch. And this is where... I'm really frustrated with how I'm going to have to approach a lot of this movie because as I said in the very beginning, it's kind of spectacular for what it's trying to do. A lot of the execution is really quite something. And again, this is a movie that is able to put on a sheer spectacle on a level and scope that is genuinely impressive. And I think a lot of the acting is good. The direction from Sam Raimi is excellent. The score is impressive. There's a lot of interesting things that they are trying to do and trying to pay off. But given some of the foundational elements of how a story like this is set up and framed, the more I think about this, the less I like it. Yes, this is me gonna go entirely into full-on nitpicking mode, 
especially coming from some accessibility points coming out of the comics. I I'm sorry, I'm apologizing for that in advance. If that stuff doesn't bother you, you're probably gonna have a ton of fun with this. I've already seen a lot of critics really get behind this as a film, but there are certain issues that are raised by this movie that I couldn't quite shake and it really bothered me. So let's start off with the comic origin point behind a lot of this whole thing. Now, the big thing that if you've seen WandaVision and you kind of really have to in order to get a lot of the full emotional through line and context of the film, basically after the events of Infinity War and Endgame when Vision died, Wanda created a whole neighborhood to process her grief and trauma where Vision was not dead. They were kind of doing a quasi old fashioned sitcom thing and she had children in that whole environment, but she created them. It was a factor of the magic that she had, her chaos magic. And one of the main underlying themes across WandaVision was how someone processes and deals with grief and trauma. What some of you might not know is that this is actually rooted in a couple specific comics that Marvel's put out over the course of the decades. Now, the whole plot line of Wanda creating her children partially out of magic and then losing them because of some connection to a darker evil force, that goes back decades. And honestly, I don't think is really well handled in the comics, mostly because I think how Marvel writes Wanda Maximoff can flail wildly, especially whether or not it's more tied into her Avengers material versus any sort of X-Men material tied in with Magneto. Different conversation, we will get to that. But what I was reminded of the most when I was watching this movie, and specifically coming out of the end of WandaVision, was a storyline called Avengers Disassembled, where basically, thanks to Brian Michael Bendis, he wrote a scene where Wanda was suddenly reminded that she had children and that she lost them and the trauma reignites anew and Wanda's chaos magic or I actually I'm not even going to get into the continuity snarl whether or not it's chaos magic at all. Basically it causes a hellish extent across a lot of Marvel for some of the worst days of the lives for the Avengers where Wanda effectively goes insane. There's a couple elements here I need to highlight. Number one, it says something more than a little squicky that someone in dealing with trauma and this sort of mental health issue then becomes framed as a threat or an ongoing villain. Because again, this sort of trauma happens to people and that doesn't make them bad people if they act out. A lot of it comes with mental health issues and squabbles. Indeed, one of the main problems that came out of the end of WandaVision is that it felt too clean to tie everything together. It didn't feel like it effectively paid off the arc of dealing with grief and trauma that she was trying to go through. Indeed, that's been pretty common for a lot of Marvel's TV miniseries following after Endgame, trying to delve into some of this terror territory and you kind of get the feeling that the writers might be a little over their heads especially when they're trying to square it with a more realistic setting the one thing that the comics can kind of get away from a little bit but now going into this story in particular there's a couple things I want to highlight in broadly discussing the plot basically Doctor Strange discovers an alternate reality version of himself that is dead, and a character who can jump between realities time and time again, who sadly comes across like a lot more of a plot device than having a lot of character of her own. And she's being chased by some sort of demonic figure that's been constantly coming after them. And then within the first five to ten minutes of the film, so again, spoiler warning, you might want to get out now, when Doctor Strange tries to recruit Ma Wanda Maximoff to come in and try and help, uh, turns out she's the ongoing running villain of this entire story. That's right, because of a woman who is dealing with the trauma of losing her lover and her hypothetical children, she goes insane and becomes the main villain of this story. Have I ever told anyone that Avengers Disassembled got a lot of backlash for generally being terrible? I understand that Marvel's got some occasional storylines that are built off of, yeah, we're going to reclaim titles and ideas that might not have been received all that well in the comics and then done better in the movies, looking at Civil War here. But at the same time, 
this was something that maybe could have been paid off in WandaVision more effectively and causing a full-on heel turn that's not quite a heel turn because you entirely know that she is sympathetic and really needs help beyond what seems like Doctor Strange is equipped to deliver. It's something that I couldn't quite get away from very early on. And this is the one thing I kind of will give some credit to Sam Raimi, the direction, and a lot of the execution of this idea. I think they did the best with what they had. Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange is kind of inspired casting. He's legit ass great in this movie. And Elizabeth Olsen playing Scarlet Witch, the amount of emotional trauma that she's trying to deal with here. She plays the role incredibly well. I was genuinely impressed with how well she's asked to balance a really tough and probably the most sympathetic villain that we've gotten out of a Marvel Cinematic Universe since, I guess, Killmonger, maybe? Even though you can argue that he's not exactly sympathetic, but that's a larger conversation about Black Panther. Whereas here, the one thing that comes out of this is that it's very quickly identified that it's not just that this is trauma that has driven Wanda to this, is that she's been egged on by some darker magical force called the Darkhold. Okay, I'm not always a fan of dark magic simply making people evil, for lack of better words. It feels like it takes away some character agency, and that definitely comes cropping up here. But uh, honestly, given how it the later cascades on for Doctor Strange, I'm mostly okay with how that goes. And then from there, it basically devolves into an extended chase scene where Wanda is chasing after Doctor Strange and the dimension hopping character so she can find this dimension hopping character, utilize and drain her powers, and then go to a, another different universe where her children have survived and she can take the place of the Wanda in that universe and basically live out her days with her children. All right, not a bad storyline. It's It's got a good focal point. There is some moral complexity that comes out of it. Like, hey, you're killing an alternate version of them to take on their life. That's, that's dark. And especially as the thing with Wanda Maximoff and the Scarlet Witch is that she's easily one of the most powerful characters within the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even if it's not always well shown throughout the course of a lot of the movies. But she, especially coming after WandaVision, where she's learned to harness and create more of her powers with that sort of darker chaos magic, now with this dark hold amplifying her worst impulses, it, it's a, she's more than an, of a match for Strange, and that's honestly plays out pretty well across the first act. And I will give, again, Sam Raimi a lot of credit for selling the stakes that come with dealing with such a powerful force now in that measure. Considering that a lot of the magic using heroes within the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's kind of tough to gauge their power, especially when it's beams of energy and reality bending. That's tougher to quantify than just punching people or blowing stuff up. I'll give them a lot of credit for actually being able to balance that out, especially when Wanda goes in against the entire uh, Sorcerer Supreme and does a lot of damage. And it very makes it clear that uh, Stephen Strange might be a little outmatched here. But then comes to a point where I honestly kind of feel bad for all the girls who dressed up like Wanda Maximum because I really fell in love with the character. I feel bad for anyone who really gets behind a lot of characters and get really pissed off when they turn evil, even if you know it's never going to be a permanent thing because, again, comic books. But this was a point that got the most pops in the theater, and I understood why they did it, but it bugged me to no end, and to explain why is going to take a little bit of time, so just stare with me. They hop into a different universe where Stephen Strange, as his, his version of Stephen Strange was dead, but not dead because he had sacrificed himself to fight against Thanos, as it was initially implied, no, no, no. He died specifically because he had also got a hold of this dark hold. It had perverted him as well, and he had to be taken down by the Illuminati. Now, the Illuminati is actually a force within the Marvel comics that normally comprises of a couple of the very highest-powered superheroes. Normally, Iron Man's a part of it. And in this case, in this specific alternate universe, the main Illuminati figures 
are basically a cameo fest. You get the new, you get the British version of a Captain America. You get Black Bolt. You get an alternate Captain Marvel. You get John Krasinski as Reed Richards, aka Mr. Fantastic. And in the biggest pop you get in the entire film, Charles Xavier as Professor X, played by Patrick Stewart. Now, okay, forget tying this into any of the continuity with the X-Men films. I don't even want to touch that. And while I was able to grasp a lot of the references because of the What If connection and uh, tied into the Inhumans, which I'm surprised anyone at Marvel was still holding on to is actually wanting to talk about at all. It was admittedly a really cool scene with that version of Stephen Strange confronting an alternate reality's selection of the heroes that would have made up the Illuminati. In fact, if I remember correctly, I think Strange himself might have been part of the Illuminati at some point. I don't quite remember. Don't quote me on that. Then Wanda Maximoff shows up in that reality and massacres the Illuminati. I'm not even kidding about that. It's the sort of scene where you get all these fan service pops. You get all these moments where, oh, cool, all these great ideas. It's very obvious that Marvel's marketing department is looking to bring in all these characters. And the characters that get the most attention out of that scene, they might get introduced in another way. Thanks to, again, the multiverse. Then Scarlet Witch kills them. All of them in surprisingly graphic fashion for a PG-13 movie. Because again, Sam Raimi is the kind of guy who will push his rating as far as you can get. Like, like literally, she snaps Charles Xavier's neck after he tries to go into her mind and help her. Yes, I know part of this is being driven off of that connection to the dark hold, some darker malevolent force, but at some point it crosses a Rubicon. At some point you realize that all these characters you introduced for your fan service then just got massacred by a hero you chose to turn evil. And you know what it reminded me of the most? It didn't remind me of a Marvel property at all. It reminded me of a DC comic line that ran for an entire year and you might have heard of it if you watch Linkara or you're familiar with the comics ethos at all because it's notoriously awful. It's called Countdown, later retitled to Countdown to Final Crisis. Basically, there's a lot of dimension hopping and universe hopping and some form of a great disaster that's prophesized that they have to chase down some other dimension hopper. And one of the things that bothered me the most out of that specific run, outside of the wildly out of character moments, the awful art, the terrible writing, was the fact that they used the destruction of an entire universe of heroes, a great disaster, in order to drive pathos for what's actually going on. But the problem is, when you do this within a multiverse context, it doesn't really impact your main universe. It's another universe over there. There's no guarantee we're ever going to go back to that universe or see that universe again. So the only reason you get this is for a very specific moment of shock value. It is that, oh, the character will go that far. The character will do that. It's designed to provoke an emotional reaction. But on the one hand, you have the stakes of oh, it's another universe, it's never going to be touched again. But on the other hand, you have the stakes of, I don't want to see Wanda Maximoff doing this. I don't want to be reminded of the worst moments that come out of DC and Marvel comics within the larger scope of multiversal storytelling. And the thing is, I can't even blame anyone for this. I can blame Marvel for this because they really set it up. I can't blame Sam Raimi for this. The way that Marvel makes these products, and again, it's more obvious than ever, especially with this film, that these are products coming out of an assembly line or to drive towards some sort of larger narrative. They may have had great arcs building into Infinity War and Endgame, but this is not that. And the one thing that drove me nuts about this is that the acting's good. The, the story beats make sense to build to that point, but because of a lot of knowledge of how these sort of mechanisms work and how the stakes were supposed to feel emotional, but logically they don't, 
and uh, on a, some level of emotional level it just bugs me for how they would push these characters and the implications behind doing so it, it just really bugged me you killed a bunch of fan service characters that presumably we were all looking forward to they got pops in the theater and for what purpose the sad thing is is that again the plot line otherwise is good. The effects are legitimately impressive as they hop to other universes and Stephen Strange is forced to draw upon his own darker impulses. And there is something of a character arc in realizing how lonely he feels hopping across dimensions and the realization that the girl that he loved is moving on and getting married and going on with her life and he's afraid of that loneliness amidst the scope of everything that's spiraling out of control dealing with powers that are so far beyond his scope he sees some sort of kinship that comes with Wanda and again there is an emotional arc to that because Wanda doesn't want to be alone like, she wants her children. She wants to be able to find that connection as a mother. I, I get why people are saying that it's a more effective payoff coming out of the end of WandaVision than what actually happened with that TV series. The problem that I'm hitting is that you ended it like this? You went to this point? You thought that was the smartest use of your time? And you know what? It almost gets away from the ending. Where, yeah, of course Stephen Strange is going to stop Wanda. She finally gets to the whole crux of everything she's doing has been at terrible cost. She was able to destroy some of those darker elements that were leaving her to evil. And then there's some element of self-sacrifice that I don't, honestly don't think is handled all that well. But since Doctor Strange himself tapped into that dark hole, some of that has corrupted now him. And that's cascading on. And I'm like, okay. I mean, we'll see this play out in the course of multiple movies. Presuming we just don't get another Doctor Strange from another reality to come fill in the blanks when people realize that this one's kind of gone off the rails. That's the thing when you introduce multiversal cosmic storytelling, where getting a handle on the stakes becomes so much more slippery. I understand that there's a larger audience that's growing a lot more accustomed to this and are still able to find the character beats that work. And maybe some of this is just me coming from an aspect of knowing the comics and having a, a kinship with what Wanda Maximoff actually delivered in the stories that you're telling. But when you compromise the stakes in manners like this i'm sorry it pulls you out of the story and this isn't even a case of being alienated because they turned a character evil because that's not gonna last i understand how marvel works my frustration comes with it being that yeah you're taking bold daring chances but it's only on the surface i appreciate sam raimi being able to delve into some of his horror iconography in order to ramp up the tension i can see the execution of what it's supposed to do i get the emotional arc that's playing forward and yeah it lands on the surface it lacks the deeper catharsis that i would want to hope would come from taking the characters down these arcs and that's really disappointing especially as this sort of multiversal storytelling can work look at no way home look at hell look at what happened with loki i really brought that up because i honestly thought there would be more tie-ins with a lot of loki's weird universe bending stuff that came out of that franchise but uh, no it didn't really happen with this kind of for the better that's more of a payoff of wandavision than anything it feels weirdly placed that's all i'm gonna say there and i don't think it's paid off nearly as well as it's set up to be there's elements of it where you can tell what they're trying to do but it didn't click as strongly because again maybe Stephen Strange doesn't have enough in own, have his own internal life to actually drive a narrative like this in comparison with what Peter Parker had to go through in No Way Home maybe that was a, a deeper element and core to connect with Ugh, this one frustrated me and what frustrates me is that again I'm coming from this with the perspective realizing there's gonna be a lot of people who are really gonna love this anyway because again it is a stunning looking film a lot of the emotional beats hit the acting is good the score is good the action is impressive as all hell it's got that spooky weirder darker side that's honestly kind of amazed at how much they got away for a pg-13 rating i'll say it again but it's the film that really made me see a lot of the mechanisms behind marvel and its marketing machine where the emotional beats felt artificial and that's what drove me away from this and leaves me less inclined to recommend it. It does everything it's supposed to be trying to do, but the context in which it does it, especially with any sort of broader expanded context, really hurts the film. 
least for me. I mean, if you're curious, give it a shot, give it a chance. Again, I had so much thoughts behind this that it really bugged me. And I think they might be able to pay it off down the road. But in a self-contained little chunk here, and even then I don't think it feels all that self-contained. Yeah, I want to like this more. But beyond that, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be extremely grateful. I know I went on at length about this, but again, this is the sort of film I had a lot to say. If you guys have any other comments or want to get stuff on my schedule, link to my Patreon is right over there. Um, you can also argue with me on Discord. Don't feel obligated about that. Again, tough times, but options available. Till then, I'm Mark. You're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.